The Roads and Traffic Authority New South Wales builds concrete pavements to carry heavy truck traffic to take the high stress caused by heavy axle loads. High quality construction is vital to cut down future costs of pavement repair and the resulting traffic delays. Every square metre of the pavement you build today will be tested by every heavy truck that uses it, day after day, for the design life of 40 years and more. RTA New South Wales has produced this and other videos to help you construct high quality concrete roads every day you're on the job. Big concrete road projects are built using multi-lane slip form paving machines with the concrete supplied in tipper trucks from high capacity on-site mixing plants. Smaller projects use fixed forms or small single lane pavers where the concrete is delivered in truck mixes from local pre-mix batch plants. Regardless of the project size, the need for high quality construction is the same. So whatever your job on the construction team, act as if what you do makes a difference to quality, because it does. And remember that safety, yours and everybody else's, is always paramount. A heavy-duty concrete highway pavement typically comprises the compacted subgrade and drainage, a select material zone 300 mm thick, a lean mix concrete sub-base 150 mm thick, and finally the high-strength concrete top layer called the base, which is usually about 250 mm thick, depending on the traffic loads. This video will focus on the concrete base and on the lean mix concrete sub-base under it. First, the base. Concrete in the base is high strength. The concrete supplied under RTA specifications is typically around 45 to 50 MPA. Most bases built by the RTA are either plain, unreinforced concrete pavement, commonly called PCP, or their continuously reinforced concrete pavement, called CRCP. In plain concrete pavements, transverse joints must be sawn every 4.2 metres, within hours of paving. These joints will soon crack, due to tension stresses resulting from contraction and curling of the concrete. In continuously reinforced concrete pavements, transverse joints are not needed. The continuous steel reinforcement induces fine transverse cracks at one to two metre centres down the pavement, thereby relieving the contraction stresses. No transverse joints means maintenance resealing is eliminated. That's why CRCP is favoured in tunnels, and where traffic volumes are very high. Both PCP and CRCP need longitudinal joints near the lane lines to relieve the curling and contraction stresses and to divide the pavement into suitable paving runs. These longitudinal joints use deformed steel tie bars to prevent them opening up wide. Concrete shoulders are usually incorporated to reduce high stresses due to truck wheels near a free edge and to eliminate shoulder maintenance. Now let's look at the sub-base. RTA builds a lean concrete sub-base under all concrete bases because concrete sub-bases provide an excellent all-weather construction platform, stable erosion-free support for the base, and better wheel load transfer across joints. Lean Mix Concrete Subbase is built using the same equipment as the base, the same batch plant and paving equipment. The subbase is paved without any control joints. Fine shrinkage cracks will develop at between 3 and 15 metre centres. The early age concrete strength is kept low, around 5 MPA, to encourage this controlled cracking. The base is debonded from the sub-base to allow the base to move independently. 
Finally, edge drains remove any water from the base and sub-base interface. So in summary, our pavement structure comprises the concrete base, the lean concrete sub-base, the SMZ, the foundation subgrade, and the drainage system. First we'll look at machine paving. Let's look at a typical slip form paver to see how it works. At the front of the paver is an auger to distribute concrete across the full width of the paver. Behind the auger is a strike off plate which screeds the concrete to a uniform surcharge into the compaction area where a bank of vibrators consolidates the concrete. The compacted concrete then enters the conforming plate where it is shaped to the correct profile. Finally, the emerging concrete surface is finished smooth with the trailing vibrating float. Depending on the paver, there may be other equipment involved. Now, back to pavement construction. There needs to be good access for concrete delivery trucks to the paving site and good communication set up between the paver, the batch plant and all crews. There must be a testing station to sample and test the quality of the incoming concrete, including its slump and its air content. Test cylinders will be made here and later tested for strength and density. There must be accurate string lines to control the paver line and level. They must be regularly checked to make sure they haven't been disturbed. On some projects, stringless, laser-guided control is used. You'll need to provide a smooth, firm surface for the paver tracks to run on. If the paver hydraulics need to react suddenly, the ride quality will suffer. Reinforcing needs to be accurately placed at the right spacing and cover and fixed firmly enough not to move as the concrete is placed. The paver settings and profiles must be correctly adjusted. All equipment like vibrators, screeds, floats, texturing tools and curing spray bars must be clean and well maintained. Supplies like the correct curing compound must be on hand, and wet weather gear too, and joint saws must be made ready. A regular supply of well mixed concrete with consistent slump is vital. You cannot build a uniformly smooth, high quality concrete pavement without consistent concrete, which means the right materials, accurately batched and fully mixed. RTA has a companion video called Making and Delivering Concrete for Road Pavements. So have a look at it for detailed information on getting the right concrete to the paver. Before spreading the concrete, if the subgrade or sub base is hot and dry, it'll need to be wet down to stop mixed water being sucked out of the fresh concrete. Fully wet the grade, but without ponding water. When the concrete load arrives, spot and spread the load evenly in front of the paver. Record every load's location in the pavement by Cheney and Lane. Place the concrete as close as possible to its final location to minimize what the paver has to move about. You'll get a smoother pavement. Remember, it's a paver, not a bulldozer. On wide reinforced pavements, you'll need a transverse spreader to distribute the concrete uniformly across the steel reinforcement in front of the paver. After spreading with the augers, the strike-off plate screeds the concrete to the right surcharge into the compaction area.
Thorough compaction of the concrete is vital. As little as 2% excess in trapped air will reduce the life of the pavement by 20 to 25 years. RTA has produced a companion video entirely on this topic. It's called Compacting Concrete for Road Pavements. Make sure you get to see this video too. During paving, the frequency and amplitude of the vibrators must be continually monitored and the speed of the paver must not exceed the maximum that will allow full compaction. The quality of the compaction will be checked by taking cores from the base and comparing their density with that of the test cylinders moulded at the testing station. After compaction, the concrete passes under the conforming plate where it is shaped to the required profile which may include a crown. Edges contain and shape the pavement sides. These edges may be slotted to allow tie bars to be inserted. All paver settings must be continually monitored and checked during each paving run. Behind the conforming plate, a vibrating pan float is used to close up the extruded surface. Longitudinal oscillating finishes are also sometimes used. Minor irregularities can be repaired by hand with edge floats and bull floats, but hand work should be minimised and hopefully eliminated. Excessive hand finishing indicates that the mixing and paving processes are not fully under control. After finishing, the thickness and level of the completed pavement must be checked, either from the string lines or by survey. Fresh concrete will often bleed after paving. No finishing should be done while that bleed water is on the surface, because working bleed water back into the concrete will weaken it, just where we want a strong, durable surface. On the other hand, in hot, dry, windy weather, the surface of the fresh concrete can dry out too quickly, resulting in plastic shrinkage cracking. An evaporation retarder can be sprayed on to prevent such cracking. As soon as the bleed water has evaporated, the concrete is ready to be textured to provide an anti-skid surface on the road. A hessian drag is used to provide skid resistance on lower speed roads. The hessian drag can be attached to the rear of the paver or onto a following work bridge depending on the finishing conditions and the bleeding rate. In addition, on higher speed roads, the surface is usually timed to improve wet weather skid resistance. Soon after texturing, the surface and the slab edges must be sprayed with a curing compound. Curing maintains moisture in the concrete so that its strength and surface wear resistance can fully develop. The curing compound must be sprayed on in a continuous unbroken film and maintained intact for at least seven days. Any gaps or damage to the film must be made good. The right equipment, the spray rates and the timing for curing and how soon the pavement can be trafficked after paving are important factors in quality construction. Curing completes the paving process, except for the installation of the joints in the base. In plain concrete base, the transverse contraction joints are at 4.2 metre centres. They need to be sawn quickly before random cracking can occur. The general rule is that sawing should be done as early as possible after paving, such that only a small amount of joint spalling occurs in the still green concrete. In multi-lane paving, longitudinal joints must also be sawn early, before cracking occurs. In summer, joint sawing may need to start just a few hours after paving, while in winter, the start might extend out beyond 12 hours. After sawing, 
The transverse joints are washed out and temporarily sealed. Later they will be washed again, a backer rod placed and then the permanent silicon sealant installed. At the beginning and end of each paving run, a construction joint must be formed. Construction joint procedures must be carefully pre-planned and then executed. To ensure full concrete compaction and a smooth ride over the joint. Jointing is the last of the major paving processes. If you're hand paving using fixed forms, the same principles of good paving apply as for slip form machine paving. You need good preparations such as solid, accurate formwork and reinforcement. A regular supply of quality concrete. Uniform spreading to minimise shoveling. Thorough compaction with poker vibrators and at least two passes of a vibrating screed. And final finishing with bull floats where necessary. After the bleed water sheen disappears, the surface can be textured. and then cured to allow the full concrete strength and durability to develop. Joint sawing then completes the pavement. Even on big slip form projects, there will be areas where machine paving is not practical. For example, at intersections and ramps where fixed form paving will be required. So skilled hand paving crews will be required on all projects. Fixed form paving is fully discussed in the compaction video, including proper use of poker vibrators and screeds. Good paving requires good planning like matching the production rate at the mixing plant with the number of delivery vehicles and the speed of the paver and having the right number of saws to get the joints cut before wild cracking occurs. Good paving also needs a skilled crew. What the paving team does has a huge influence on the quality, durability and performance of the road for many years to come. And always remember, act as if what you do makes a difference, because it does.